Hello, I'm Pierre. I'm a security analyst at eShard, which is a security company based in France. And I'll present to you a study that we made. Uh, is the arm trust zone uh, attackable by Rohammer? Uh, don't worry, um, the presentation contains an introduction of both technologies and uh, will shortly uh, also describe the attack. Uh, sorry, more or less 25 minutes. Um, so what is Rohammer? It's a, an attack technique that's used to corrupt uh, RAM that's been around for a few years. Uh, what is Trust Zone? It's a security uh, technology that's in most ARM processors nowadays and uh, we'll use Rohammer in order to target the Trust Zone implementation uh, in, a, in, a, in a system. Uh, this Trust Zone is uh, in every smartphone that we use nowadays Android-based smartphones, so it's uh, a bit ubiquitous. Um, so first, a bit of context. Uh, there's been, uh, Rohammer has been around for a few years, uh, and there's been uh, multiple implementations on PCs, on mobiles, and uh, every time uh, the usage of it is uh, to gain more privileges, like root privileges, from a user program. This study is not about this, it's about targeting a secure uh, OS from Linux. So it's a bit different. Uh, what about Trozone? Uh, do we have uh, attacks about it? Yes, uh, most of the time it's uh, software bugs uh, in the secure OS which allows you to take control over it. And uh, very recently there's a, a similar, uh, a bit similar attack that uh, that went out, went out uh, that uses faults uh, generated by um, uh, scaling, uh, power, uh, power scaling, etc., to, to create faults in uh, the mi microarchitecture. Um, so it, it's a bit similar. Um, what's uh, the, 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 the attack about? So. We have uh, on our system a Linux kernel, a Linux system, and uh, next to it, I there's a secure OS that's running. Uh, on most Qualcomm smartphones, it's Qualcomm Secure OS, for example. In our case, for our proof of concept, it's a secure uh, OS that we derived from uh, an open source project and, the at and that we attacked from uh, a Linux uh, system. Uh, what's the objective? We want to corrupt memory in the secure system, which is normally impossible. Uh, and uh, if possible, uh, what, uh, exploit these faults in order to gain more privileges or retrieve secure keys, etc. Uh, we don't care about uh, routing the system. Uh, so we, we, the aim of the attack is to attack the secure side from the non-secure side. So we we take directly full privileges in the non-secure side. So we are a kernel module if we want. Um, so this is the POC that we made. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, uh, a Linux system, and uh, we have a TE, trusted uh, environment, that provides a signature mechanism to the Linux side, which is quite common in smartphones. You have the key master thing, which you can use from uh, Android. Uh, and uh, we'll use Rohammer in order to fault some keys in the secure region of memory. And then this will allow us to retrieve uh, private keys using a well-known uh, crypto attack, which is uh, the Belcore attack, if you're familiar with it. Uh, so this is the picture of it. Uh, you have a Linux program here. Uh, you're asking the TE, the trusted OS, to sign a message for you. Uh, the secure system will use some keys that are stored in its private space, in the secure space, and then it will return the signature on the public key. What we'll do is uh, we'll do a raw hammer attack on the memory. It will corrupt some parameters in the keys uh, here. Uh, that because of that, uh, the signature will be faulty. Uh, it will compute a C prime signature instead of uh, a normal one and we'll get a corrupted a faulty uh, signature and that will allow us to retrieve the private key using uh, the Belcore mechanism. About Rohammer, uh, a, a small introduction about Rohammer. 
what we want to do is corrupt things in the DRAM chips, and we are executing code here. And there are several elements that uh, prevent us from directly accessing the, the RAM. There are the caches, uh, the DRAM controllers that have some optimization logics, etc. And what we need to do is do lots of accesses so that will corrupt uh, memory cells. Uh, so you have to know the layout of the DRAM cells, etc. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the biggest uh, issue. Uh, the, the caches are, are the biggest issues. Um, so to, to understand how to implement uh, such a system, we need to understand uh, how RAM works. So every bit of RAM is uh, stored as uh, in a capacitor. And uh, when it's charged, it means it's a uh, one. And uh, when it's discharged, it's a zero. Uh, the capacitors uh, can lose uh, charge over time. So they need to be recharged uh, over time. Also, if you read uh, a bit of memory, it will be re uh, discharged and then recharged to preserve its uh, value. Uh, all these uh, uh, DRAM chips is uh, made of multiple banks, um, usually eight banks. Each bank is organized in arrays, usually, uh, for example, eight arrays here. And uh, then uh, each array is a grid of capacitor. It's a simplification, but it's, it looks like this. And when you want to read a bit of memory, you have to do it row by row. So what happens? You have a, a, an address that you want to read. Uh, the CPU drives uh, uh, some things. It goes to the DRAM controller, and the address arrives at the DRAM controller. Uh, the most significant bits are um, the, uh, gives you which row to access, and then the least significant, significant bits let you select some uh, some bits. So, so there, there's only a few operations that that you can do on rows. You can activate a row. That means that all capacitors will be discharged and read to a row buffer, and then uh, you get your data out and it goes back to the CPU. Uh, the thing is, if you access a row, if you activate a row several times in a row. Uh, <laughs> That's called row hammer, and it will uh, probably disrupt the cells that are nearby. So if you access, the, the issue is if you access a row, uh, row let's say row two, uh, several times, several times consecutively, you will hit the row buffer, and you won't activate the same row a lot of times. So what you need to do in, in order to create faults is accessing uh, two distinct rows in a single array. And that will do things like that. So for example, we, we access row one, row four, row one, row four in a, in a loop. What do we get? We may generate some faults. So maybe this, bits go, this bit goes from zero to one or one to zero. And uh, that's bad. Um, one thing uh, which is interesting, it's uh, if you access uh, two rows, uh, if, if you want to target a row n, uh, the most efficient way is to to hammer uh, to access consecutively row n minus one on n uh, n plus one. It's uh, ca a kind of combo combo attack. Um, so the th the problem we have say, is uh, how do we address rows from the CPU because uh, all we have is addresses and uh, we don't even know uh, about rows normally. So we need to determine the physical uh, properties of the, of the, of the DRAM. Uh, usually, uh, so you have something like that. And you would think that uh, consecutive access will uh, access consecutive rows. But it's mostly, most of the time not the case for, for uh, bandwidth reason. Uh, usually, when you access uh, consecutive addresses, it will go from one bank to another, so that when uh, you uh, you don't need to deactivate this row in order to access this one, etc. So it maximizes the, the bandwidth. Um, so we need to know uh, how many banks there is, uh, the width of a row, etc. And it's all variable. It uh, depends on which DRAM chip you, you use. So uh, you can read the, the data sheet if you have it, or if you can determine which uh, DRAM you have. But uh, one thing you can do 
is use uh, a timing char characterization. Uh, uh, we use that and it gives good results. Uh, and it lets you deduce the number of banks and also the size of a row. Uh, what you know is that accessing two distinct rows in a single array is slow because the first row has to be uh, uh, refreshed uh, before activating the second one, etc. So if you have, um, if you take uh, a base address and then access all addresses which are nearby, you will realize that sometimes it's slow, and it means that you are in the same bank and the same array. So, for example, in this case, we we had a, a DRAM which had uh, eight k's of uh, width, and uh, this DRAM chip. Uh, use the uh, eight banks. Once you have that, you know how to access rows, but how to bypass the caches, etc. Uh, in, uh, in most uh, implementations of Rowhammer, the issue is to bypass the cache using uh, techniques like cache eviction, etc. But since we are in kernel space, we don't have this issue. Uh, since we are kernel, we can decide which uh, attributes um, our memory mapping uses. So that's something the kernel does all the time uh, in order to access devices, like for example, a timer. If you have a timer that provides a memory mapped uh, value of the time, you don't want it to be cached. Uh, you want to read the real value of time and uh, that's why memory attributes exist. So we can do that for the RAM. Uh, that's an advantage because we are in kernel space and targeting the, the secure OS. So that's easy. Um, uh, the algorithm of Rohammer is pretty simple. Uh, you just access uh, the rows. <laughs> and what happens after this loop, a number of iterations, uh, some bits around the row before and row after will be corrupted if the device is vulnerable. What about row zone? Uh, so what is row zone? Uh, it's a security uh, technology that's uh, built into all Cortex-A processor that we have in, uh, in uh, smartphones. And uh, yeah, that's the equivalent of having a separate secure processor, but uh, we don't have to buy, uh, the system integrators don't want to have uh, two processors because it's too costly. It uses silicon space, etc. so it's okay. Uh, uh, the basics of it is uh, you have a, a processor and you are time sharing it between the non-secure side and the secure side. So you have two OS running, one which is Linux usually and one which is a, a proprietary uh, secure OS. Um, and you can go uh, like a time sharing between two user processes. You are scheduling one OS or the other. Uh, how does this work? So the CPU can operate in two modes, secure or non-secure, on every uh, memory uh, operation is marked with the state in which uh, the processor was when the read was made or the write was made. So, so for example, we are running a, an Android uh, application. It's in non-secure state. So every read, every read that goes to the DRAM controller is marked as NS, non-secure. And uh, if we are running the in the secure state, then uh, it will be marked S, uh, which is uh, secure. Uh, and then the DRAM controller needs to be aware of this flag, and uh, if it wants, it can block some uh, some uh, operations that uh, it feels uh, are not uh, legal. So usually, you have a part of DRAM that is reserved for the secure OS, and uh, let's say uh, uh, from zero to to uh, a value, and uh, for example, if it sees uh, that, uh, it will just return an error. So if you have your, your smartphone and you're trying to access the portion of memory that is reserved for the secure S, you'll get an exception. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty flexible. Uh, any IP block can be adapted to have some rules about security. It just has to interpret uh, the, the this flag. In our case, we are inter interested about the memory controller, and ha this is how it's implemented usually. You have a, where is the CPU here, and uh, you have a DRAM controller, 
And what you can do is modify your DRAM controller in order to have it to for it to have rules about uh, which portion is secure or insecure. Or you can use uh, a separate IP in front end which has these rules and uh, uh, acts a bit like a, a firewall. Uh, in terms of processor architecture, uh, the CPU architecture was extended a bit so that you can uh, have a secure state on a, on a non-secure state. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, if you don't have trust zone, you, are, you have only the black parts and trust zone duplicates uh, this, uh, this stuff and uh, adds a new mode which acts as a bridge. So for example, uh, you are in a Android application here. You ask the standard key master to sign something for you. Uh, the processor will have to switch from, you, you'll make a syscall to go to the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel knows it has to talk to a, an app that's uh, running in secure side. Uh, so it will uh, ha ask the monitor mode to, to switch to the secure side and uh, then the secure OS will be scheduled, etc. So it normally does a, an, anima an animation, but it looks like this. You can do things like that and then go back. Uh, during execution time, it looks like this. Uh, your CPU boots in boot, uh, boots uh, normally with the bootloader, etc., in secure state. Uh, it will uh, initialize its OS, then pass uh, the hand to the Linux ke kernel, etc. And when uh, Linux wants to ask something to the other side, it just does a, a context switch using the monitor. Uh, so, we know how raw hammer works, we know how trust zone works, uh, what is the attack? The attack is uh, corrupting uh, the secure processor memory. Uh, and an example exploitation is this signature attack. Uh, so this is the math about the signature RS, RSA signature uh, implementation. Uh, there is a well-known optimization of this uh, calculation, which is the CRT implementation of an RSA signature. And uh, it uses these parameters. Uh, I won't explain, you can uh, find it uh, on the internet. And what happens is if you corrupt one of these parameters, DQ, for example, then from the faulty signature that you got, you can deduce the private keys. So this is what we implemented. Um, this is uh, our implementation. We have a trusty secure OS, uh, uh, which uses some private keys. Uh, we have our Linux kernel here with the uh, kernel module that's used to do uh, the raw hammer attack on the trusty OS. And uh, we have the calculations about the GCD, et cetera, in the user space tool. How the physical memory is split? Uh, so this is the whole 32-bit uh, uh, virtual memory uh, view of the system from uh, from the CPU, for example. Uh, the DRAM is mapped at this physical uh, physical address, uh, and uh, here in red we can see the parts which are reserved for marked as secure by the DRAM controller. Uh, what Linux can access is only the red parts. So we'll uh, do a raw hammer attack on the border of the of the memory regions, and uh, it will corrupt some bits here in the keys, and uh, that will let us retrieve uh, the private keys. Um, so this is how it happens. Uh, we have this uh, user space user space tool which. Uh, uh, has a message, sends it to the trusti trusted side. The trusted side generates a signature, and then uh, the user space tool tries to comp um, compute the GCD that we just saw. If it's equal to n, then uh, no faults have happened in the correct place, and uh, we cannot retrieve the the key. Uh, if we do our raw hammer attack, uh, so that's our way to communicate with the kernel module. Uh, for example, here we we, uh, we access these rows at these addresses, and that will probably um, uh, generate faults in the nearby memory areas. 
Uh, we also have counters from the DRAM controller, uh, which tells us how many reads per second we do, uh, because that's the important thing about Rohammer. If you can't do enough uh, accesses per second, uh, then uh, your attack is not successful. Uh, this is a case where uh, the uh, we, we used the, the raw hammer attack. It corrupted the keys in the trusted side, and uh, we got we got uh, a faulty signature. And uh, what does it give uh, give us? We we can deduce the, a private factor, and if you have one, uh, you have uh, the whole private key. Um, uh, what happens if from uh, the Linux side you try to access directly? Uh, Secure memory, you get uh, this kind of exception we talked about. Uh, it's a kind of external abort. It's uh, an exception that comes uh, from the outside of the CPU. The conclusion is that uh, trust zone or and things where uh, you share some resources with the, uh, when there's a non-secure, um, I mean, uh, if you share things uh, between non-secure and secure, uh, there's probably a way uh, that uh, it can be attacked. Uh, so th that's a proof that uh, trust zone is not perfect. Uh, uh, the limitation of this attack is that you have to have critical things in the secure and unsecure border. And uh, probably some uh, current uh, implementations that you have in smartphones can be attacked this way. And uh, the mitigation is simple. You just have to not put uh, critical things uh, near the border, uh, and this is uh, an ad from, <laughs> from our company. Uh, we have uh, a few intern in internships positions. <laughs> uh, questions, and I also have a, a recording of a demo. Uh, if maybe oh, we can look at the demo and take question after. Okay. It's uh, anyway. It's just a terminal. Uh, it looks like this. You have the okay. <laughs> uh, a black box demo. Okay, uh, you, you just have a kernel booting. <laughs> I, I think it's useless. Some <laughs> stuff, but it's not very important. Uh, I need to scroll. But it's just what you saw, actually. Uh, there's nothing uh, much, much to see. Uh, so what happens? Uh, you need to use our. M we use our module. Uh, it does a minute. Uh, what we'll do is try to get a signature uh, because no faults have happened. We can't get the private factor. Now we are trying to do the raw hammer attack. So it takes some time in order to, to access memory. We're trying to sign something. We get a faulty signature, and we find the private factor. We can ask the trusted side to regenerate a, a pair of key and observe that. Uh, oh no, that's not what we. Uh, we try to to access secure memory, so that's the kind of thing you get a kernel exception. And uh, if you try to regenerate a pair of key, then uh, uh, it's not faulty, so you so you won't. Uh, it's a bit uh, a demonstration that uh, it's not uh, it's not fake. <laughs> uh, you have to really to do the, the raw armor stuff to to get the private key. That's all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for some questions, comments. Yes, uh, sorry. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I think it's somewhat quite clear for me how you managed to do um, a fault on one row. What happens if you have several faults, especially if you have two faults, well, one fault in, uh, in each sub-exponent in, um, in RSA? So, for example, if you fault uh, DP on DQ, it doesn't work because that's how the Belcore attack uh, works. But you may have luck and sometimes fault only uh, a parameter. You can do, uh, unless the, the system is protected by some uh, 
you can only do a few uh, signatures and uh, and then uh, you can't anymore but it's a some l it's luck <laughs> uh, you can you, yeah you 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 try uh, until you 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 fold the correct stuff it's a bit random <laughs> okay other question comments uh, I have a question o how long does it take to to mount such kind of attack you spend uh, two days one one year <laughs> three years I don't have uh, any idea we were already interested in Trezon before doing this uh, this study so it took us uh, maybe three three months it, it went uh, a bit fast uh, we, we thought it would take uh, more time but uh, yeah it can take a long time and sometimes you have uh <laughs> and how do you have the, the intuition that it will work because you you never ah, know <laughs> because uh, we there's raw hammer that's working on uh, the system and uh, there's no reason why uh, there's no countermeasure uh, for it, so it must work. <laughs> That's uh <laughs> okay. Do you have an idea about the countermeasure? Uh, yes, you just don't put uh, critical stuff near the uh, within the reach of raw hammer. Okay. So and thank you again, and be quiet after. Thanks again, the speaker. We have some announcement about the general chair. Thanks again.